do in this closing session is to have a debrief. And so we've asked the volunteers um, to uh, work with the group leaders to write three to four main points um, on a PowerPoint. I know some of the groups haven't had a chance to do that. That's fine. Um, so I'd like to ask the group, uh, representative group leader uh, from each of the five sessions in the first workshop to come to the podium. Come up to the front, please. Um, so this is David Elkin. Um, he helped us co-lead the mental health and well-being workshop. Hi, everyone. So I think we had a productive session. We actually spilled over into a second hour. I'm pulling up my more detailed notes. These were some of the issues that we looked at, though. Things like, what is capacity? And I think here we want to drive home the point that capacity is not a simple determination. It's more of a dynamic finding, something that people, um, that occurs in a context of, a, of usually a healthcare provider patient relationship, but it's ideally uh, based on someone who knows the person very well. We also talked about the difference between having capacity and um, having insight. A number of people raised the point that there are people who have capacity to make medical decisions, but they may not have a great deal of insight about what's actually happening for them. Uh, the role of primary care in assessing mental health and capacity, I'm sure that's been on people's minds. I mean, do people here feel adequately prepared to say that someone is depressed? We also talked a lot about the difference between uh, and this goes into the third point, depression and demoralization. Um, there's a, a critical article about that by Griffin and Gabby um, about demoralization as opposed to depression. The fact that we don't want to just label everything as a medicalized problem, but rather recognize that there is existential suffering. And the existential issues, I think, are the things that typically really came up for the, the group. So can providers recognize suffering when they see it? And usually that suffering is existential. What has the meaning of my life been? What is the nature of my dying going to be? How connected can I be with other people? Uh, what responsibility do I have to other people versus can I be selfish, quote unquote selfish, think of myself? Um, if, I, if I pursue physician uh, aid in dying. Um, we talked br very briefly, too briefly, about moral distress among healthcare providers also. Those are some of the points that we touched on. I think we had a pretty broad ranging discussion. Um, anyone who was there want to add anything at all? Could I just ask a quick question, Liz, Please. if you don't mind? Um, so how do you think that institutions should address these things in their uh, Iterative, we've already heard that the policy making process probably should be iterative. So how, how do you think they should attend to these issues? I think, again, um, if people have different opinions, I'd like to hear them, but I think we were rejecting the idea that a mental health professional would come in on a one-time basis and make a diagnosis. I think it seems very unrealistic. I think we favored the model in which a mental health professional would come in and consult with a dyad of healthcare professional and patient and try to work with them to strengthen that. Um, we also talked about providers getting to know patients better, and we talked about the seven-point model. But we also talked about the fact that 15 minutes per patient interaction is way too short. Um, so there's this whole problem with the model of healthcare itself, uh, which one of our attendees made very eloquently. What is wrong with healthcare in this country that we can spend a trillion dollars a year and yet we don't have the time to spend with our patients to adequately really address their, their problems? I don't know if that addresses your question. Yeah, great. But. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, and thank you to the participants and everyone. Um, now I'd like to move on to the religious and spiritual issues. Do you want to start us off? And I'll oh, uh, sure. I'm, can, I'm, can I'm Megan O'Keefe, and uh, I. We had actually two really interesting sessions. The first session was mainly um, people who were chaplains um, or social workers, and then the second group um, we had was mainly physicians um, and other uh, sort of clinical providers. And and I think, um, if you want to, yeah, I think I, I think what was interesting is the chaplains were saying we've got to advocate advocate for ourselves. To, to find a place here. And part of that finding a place is for people to fund us to, to do this work. And, um, and then the providers came in and were saying things like, well, we really need to know, we, we, we need help for ourselves as providers for the existential crises we go through in doing this work. And, um, and so it was clearly the providers see a need for this kind of work and the chaplains and the social workers also see a need, but somehow these two aren't getting together. So that was one of the concerns I saw. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think um, one of the other things that, that really came through is that um, 
we essentially had time to talk about needs, um, but not how to implement things. Um, that there is, there seems to be a great deal of concern about the spiritual and religious aspects of this, um, but not, we, we weren't able to get to a place where we were talking about implementation of policies, how to support these, how to integrate it in a better way. Um, yeah, I, I, we framed it mainly as like, what are your issues that this august body needs to address um, on, a, on a policy and implementation level? So. And I, I think one of the most important things that came through is that there's a real need um, for chaplains who are professionally trained yes. and trained in palliative care. Right, yeah. Yeah, let me just underscore that. It's not good enough that you're, if you're at a low budget and you say, well, okay, I recognize the need for a spiritual care, let's bring some volunteers in, because they can be the most dangerous people you bring in if they're not really understanding, if they're coming there with their religious agenda as something we don't want to happen. Chaplains, in case you aren't aware, are really trained to do interfaith or no faith. I mean, we, we're, whatever, as I mentioned earlier today, whatever the human issues are that have that existential part to it, we're trained to deal with that. Bringing in the religious, if that's what the patient needs, or knowing when to leave it at the door when it's clearly what they don't need. Yeah, thank Great. you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to have cultural issues come up, please. Hi, my name is Deborah Unger, and this is Pooja Bajal. We're both uh, clinical palliative medicine fellows who both did research years uh, in the prior year at Stanford. So there were three main topics that came up in our talk and then a few additional issues. And the first is that physician-assisted dying would exponentially increase the difficulty of talk, taking account into culture um, near the end of life. And some of the additional comments were that there were concerns that this would bring up feelings of anger and questions about um, patients feeling um, that there was untrustworthiness in the medical community. There were also com comments on um, how this idea of independence and interdependence is very different in different cultures, and what is considered independent in one culture is not necessarily the norm in another. Uh, there was also a, a lot of concern that talking about this topic would just add a whole other layer of complexity and honestly time-consuming effort um, when we're doing our advanced care planning and that there is an extreme need for appropriate educational materials um, in training both um, trainees and in the, the clinical settings and how to avoid stereotypes um, because every patient and family is different how to approach them as an individual. The second and third main issues that kind of came up while we were talking was the culture of biomedicine, um, that physicians have a lot of power over their patients and how they discuss and frame these issues is very important. And one of the things as a part of that was that there's a fair amount of silence regarding disability versus ability and how that feeds into this issue. Another thing that was very worrisome and brought up frequently was this idea of coercion and what defines coercion, and that coercion can be seen very differently in di different cultural circumstances, that in many co cultures that um, family decision making is the norm, while in other cultures individual decision making is the norm. So the few other miscellaneous items that were also themes in our session Education, as I mentioned, both for trainees and in the clinical settings, um, and that this importance of not just cultural diversity and cultural competence, but accepting cultural humil humility and dexterity, um, particularly in this, that the understandings of death are very different across cultures. And I'll probably go ahead and stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Um, um, and so next I'd like to move on to the vulnerable populations group, which I'm sure has uh, overlapping issues between the two. All right, um, and this is... No, 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 no. Uh, uh, this is Clarissa Kripke. So yes, many, many overlapping issues. We started our group by talking about who is a vulnerable population in this context, and we came up with a wide-ranging thing, for everything from disability to Language, language issues, poverty, elderly, people who are unfriended, unsupported, uh, people who are homeless and may not have anywhere that they can go, 
people who are undocumented, people who lack access to long-term care and other resources that they need, um, and, and racial vulnerabilities. And we talked about a case of an 85-year-old woman with metastatic cancer who had made a request, and then we brought that into different different aspects of what could come up. One is elder abuse. So the first part was uh, was about a, um, a a son who was going to inherit that was also going to be a witness and was saying, yes, this is what my mother wants, and that isn't necessary. And that person can witness. And you know, does that constitute coercion or does that constitute? And you know, it wasn't it wasn't clear. But then, how do you address it? And how do you um, how do you explore those concerns? Uh, it's an awkward conversation. Um, disability and IHHS, so a person who needs long-term supports and doesn't feel like they can access enough. And um, an another case was uh, uh, feeling like living longer was going to be a financial burden to a daughter, um, and so wanting to get it over with for that purpose. And and then ability bias, um, using words like burden and tragic and suffering and uh, and you know undignified um, and and how that might impact how people felt about the prescription and um, you know when when the the ask for the prescription might have been um, an invitation to a conversation about their needs or their fears, um, but but then this language sort of suggesting that this is the best option. And uh, I'm not sure that we, I, I guess there were some themes in the two groups in terms of the uh, ideas, but one is um, was certainly about resources and that most doctors and even social workers don't know the full range of resources and rights that can be accessed when, pe when resources are an issue. Um, and that that is maybe a subspecialized area that a, a team needs. If, if you're going to create some sort of team that works on this issue, they need to be very familiar with what resources are available um, and and how to push the envelope on those resources. Because sometimes you know you can have a maximum number of IHHS hours, but you know if you have a good enough lawyer, then then rules can be broken, et cetera. Um, and uh, then uh, and just the the competency of the workforce in terms of their ability to talk about these issues and um, and a need to to have have more highly trained groups of people who are doing it to, to avoid some of these pitfalls. Okay. Great. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, and then the last workshop will be on education, and this is, of course, something that will um, be something that we all, um, especially, will be having to deal with. This is Stephanie Harmon from Stanford. Hi. So we kind of had the Boiling the Ocean workshop um, in terms of education. Uh, um, and so I think, um, you know, one of the big areas that uh, we've spent some time in looking at was that there's really trainees in education across different levels and across institutions, um, individuals, um, groups, uh, and uh, uh, hospitals, clinics, et cetera, and, and policymakers. And so we looked at uh, the types of, of education um, that we were thinking about. and looking at kind of the cadre of actually these conversations themselves and the communication skills that would um, be important to underscore and build the foundation for that. Um, and that would be a kind of across um, venues, institutions, uh, and that then there was a much more kind of a ops category of education and content around po like process and kind of mapping that out um, for the different uh, folks who will be participating in this. We talked about the category in terms of education around attitudes and how do we actually enhance um, attitudes around uh, humility. Um, we mentioned, we actually discussed cultural humility um, as well as kind of conflict resolution. And, uh, and looking at this um, from the standpoint of how do we actually um, resource or access resources for education, especially as many of us are going to be doing the same things, um, and thinking about how would we create a central kind of repository where there'd be educational materials, um, whether that's things like maps versus um, trigger cases or trigger videos that would be useful and be able to be accessed um, by everyone who's doing this kinds of education. So, and uh, I don't know if there's anyone else here from the workshop that wanted to add anything, but. Thank you very much for a very robust discussion. Great, thank you.
And we also had a session on re research over lunch. Um, so I'm going to ask Neil Wenger from UCLA to briefly summarize that in about three minutes. So we learned <laughs> during the research session um, that there's a whole lot of people interested in doing research. <laughs> and uh, there was a paucity of uh, ability to think of places to fund that research. <laughs> um, there was some thought that perhaps PCORI would, ha would be interested. Um, CHCF has evidenced interest. Um, but Barbara told us that they would need to think about researching this. It would have to be in the context of a broader issue, such as palliative care um, or, or other uh, important outcomes. Um, we identified the two probably main issues for us to research as things that had to do with diversity, uh, diversity of patients um, requesting, receiving, carrying out. Um, as well as some of the outcomes involved. Um, an interesting idea was floated to compare outcomes uh, among uh, uh, health systems and institutions that chose to uh, different methods of implementation, including non-implementation uh, of the law, um, which uh, seems like a really great idea. Um, but it was also noticed that perhaps one would want to focus on the 24 out of 25 that uh, chose not to receive aid in dying and uh, what the implications are of the law for those individuals. Um, perhaps the, the, thing that, the thing I learned that's probably most important is that we shouldn't expect to be able to use any of the data that CDPH uh, will receive, um, that uh, they will put them out uh, in the form that the law prescribes, but they won't be available for research. Um, at least that was my perception of what I heard. And therefore, it's really important for us to uh, develop other methods to, co to collect such data. And it was suggested that perhaps a common set of data elements might be developed across health systems that are implementing uh, this, uh, this law. And uh, that was a pretty widely accepted uh, idea as something that would be really good. Great. Thank you very much. We're just going to go again by uh, workshop uh, one by one and go through um, some main points. And actually, before we do this, I just want to do a round of applause for the volunteers. which I'm sure we'll do again at the end of the day, but this uh, just seeing all these things being synthesized in real time to have the notes is absolutely extraordinary. Um, so anyway. Uh, Go ahead and, um, and we'll start with the inpatient session or the inpatient setting, including hospitals and long-term care. Uh, Neil Wenger again. Yeah, there it is. Okay, I get to talk because I'm the only one left here. I think. Um, <laughs> so we 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 actually had a, a wonderfully robust discussion. Uh, about policy development in the inpatient setting and the variety of different kinds, kinds of issues that would need to be tackled. And we are lucky enough to have several individuals from Oregon there to help inform uh, how the policies uh, were developed. And perhaps the thing that most important that we learned is that um, policies needed to be updated and changed based on the experience. And uh, we're, we were taught that to uh, recognize that uh, this would be something that would have to change over time and to try to learn from each other. Um, the, I guess the main points were that we wanted to collect some policies from Oregon and Washington inpatient settings and build off what, what they had learned. Um, we're particularly, the, uh, an important point was that many of our institutions end of life policies, such as that for palliative sedation, with, withholding or withdrawing life sustaining treatment, likely had many of the checks and balances incorporated in them already from an institutional perspective that we might be able to then use um, should there uh, be implications for this law in the inpatient setting. Um, a lot of discussion about inter-team and cross-team conflicts and opinions and how to use teams to ensure that the law gets implemented appropriately, not just for the 1 out of 25, but for the 24 out of 25. And this is both in the hospital and the nursing home and transitions between the two. Um, and then there was some concern that nursing homes uh, that policies needed to be developed for nursing homes because patients might enter nursing homes that are already in the midst of a process um, or uh, consultants might come into nursing homes who don't quite understand that nursing home policies may not permit uh, aid in dying and that uh, policy development needed to be cognizant of each of those issues. 
Terrific, thank you very much. Um, next, we'll have uh, institutions with mandatory opt-out policies, such as the VA and Catholic hospitals. Um, and next, we'll have Lori Dengberg. Um, we had really great discussions. Um, I'm going to start with sort of the themes and some of the questions that um, arose as we talked about some of the policy development. And the, the last thing we talked about, and I think the most, it was mostly important, is what does a non-participating provider do when they receive a request for physician-assisted dying? And what we really talked about is what that conversation looks like, you know, what led you to bring you to this topic and, and how you introduce and open the conversation. But really it's about what we do do and not what we don't do. And that's, um, so whether you're uh, for assisted suicide or aid in dying or against it or neutral, that it should look, that conversation should look no different when a patient approaches you um, requesting assisted dying. So that's one of the things that our pol policy should really be about what we do do and not sort of the negative policy about only about what we don't do. Um, four other things emerge as far as questions um, when policy is developed, that the policy should not only be a doctor-centric policy. So that gets to, um, you know, a lot of our policies, if you don't provide um, aid in dying, then you refer back to the attending physician. But there's a whole host of other clinicians and other disciplines from the housekeeper when that housekeeper may have, a patient may say, you know, talk about it. How do you begin, how do you address a policy, which you probably don't do in policy, but how do you educate all levels of staff to the policy and what those conversations should look like and what referrals for resources within in the institution? So one, don't make your policies just doctor-centric. Uh, secondly, um, guidelines, uh, you know, there's gonna be pretty clear for opt-out facilities and opt-out entities, you know, they're not present during the ingest ingestion of the lethal medication but then there's a whole spectrum uh, before and mo mainly after that. So there probably needs to be some guidelines on um, what you do um, and what the sort of the spectrum of participation or non-participation is around or after the ing ingestion of medication, especially if there are complications. Um, and that, I know one of the policies says that we take care of the symptoms that arise that are within our plan of care. Uh, but it's not sort of letting the patient um, struggle, but really I think institutions will have to figure out what that scope of um, support is going to be um, post-ingestion if there are complications. Um, the, the third issue is this whole notion of referrals and what referrals mean. You know, there's an eth ethical obligation versus a legal obligation around referrals. I know within the VA there's some specific concerns because a referral is also reimbursed. Um, but there's sort of a spectrum of um, what referrals mean from education about what the options are to who may provide, et cetera. So your policies need to probably address some issues around referrals and education. And I think that was it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so next, we'd love to hear from the outpatient setting uh, team, and I believe Sarah McBain will be. So we had a varied group in our room talking about outpatient settings, and we sort of looked at three overarching questions or themes. What might individual providers need to think about as they develop their own policies and practices? Um, what might outpatient institutions that were going to do this need to think about in developing policies? And then also for the outpatient institutions that were not going to do this, what would be important components for those to consider for their um, policies? So, so there you know, was a lot of discussion and of course you know, a lot of very um, you know, passionate opinions as we've seen throughout the day. And you'll notice that we have, what we have here is very similar to some of the other themes that have been discussed already. We determined very quickly that there were some different needs depending on the size of the, of the institution or the practice and what, my, what a small um, individual in a community practice would need would actually be different from that in a, that, excuse me, from those needs in a larger institution. And there's a lot of talk about resources and what resources, what resources were available, what resources should be available, um, how those things might be addressed in policies. 
And then a key point that came up was what would be the mechanism to deal with the providers' emotions and feelings around this issue and how might the policy accommodate for those sorts of things. For those of you who are also in there, anything else you would want to bring up for the group? No? Okay, thank you. Excellent, thanks Sarah. And then finally we have the home-based systems and we'll have Holly Swagger. What I think is so interesting is, um, although we're all very different provider structures, our themes are pretty much the same. And what came up for us, we had hundreds of questions on all sorts of things, but they boil down to three areas probably. Um, one was the policy, and that policy isn't black and white. It's a continuum, and it'll continue to change over time based on what we're um, impacted with, what, we're, um, what we face the patients that are brought to us, what happens, and that it has to be a dialogue and a process that will continue. Um, we talked about process. There's lots of questions that have to be asked in process. Um, we talked about the fact that how will we know which long-term care facilities um, will allow it and which won't, which hospitals will or won't, which hospices will or won't, physicians, which physicians will prescribe and won't. So there's a lot of information from a, um, in order to even develop a process that we don't have information on, and we need that information. Uh, how do you handle the, the, the inner dynamics with your employees so that there's not judgment, um, so that um, everyone can have a place and opinion, and how do you identify who the people are that may want to participate or don't want to participate and support people through that, that, um, those roles. And then finally, the whole issue of education, which gets down to in home-based situations, frequently the person, and I, I, I'm sure it's similar in a hospital too. I mean, who does the patient talk to? The housekeeper that comes in all the time. <laughs> um, in hospice, it's the person that gives them the bed bath all the time or the volunteer that sits with them. So it can't, even though we might have a point person that is the knowledge holder of this all and the expert, so to speak, within an agency, the education has to be agency-wide because you never know who will, um, who the patient will feel most comfortable with bringing this up. So um, we had a lot of questions, not so many answers. <laughs> oh, and did I miss anything? I think, I think we've got some slide discordance, slides. so, but yeah. Michael, the... do you want to add anything? Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can, is there anyone who wants to raise another point or a discussion item that happened uh, before we go? I'm just going to do some final summary slides to ask you again whether you feel prepared and things like that. Um, but before we do that, and, and I'm assuming we still have the mics uh, available to be passed in the audience? The law, the DEA law has changed for hospice. We can no longer destroy medications, narcotics. So in the home, they belong to the family. So the question was, so let's say a patient's on hospice, has um, received the, the prescription, dies naturally, doesn't use it, what's our instruction to the family in regard to that? Is there part of the, I mean, the law doesn't really speak to it, I yeah. don't think. Does, we had several representatives of the pharmacy association here. Are, is, are either of them still here? Be interesting to hear their take, if anyone. So I'm Vicki Ferrici. I'm the Director of Pharmacy Services for Pathways Hospice okay. um, and an Associate Professor at UCSF. Um, you know, actually the DEA directs that anything that's a Schedule II is to be disposed of as directed in the package insert. And I can tell you all of those package inserts say to put them in the, I know nobody likes to hear this, to dispose of them in the water, in the toilet, or in the sink. And I know that that's against, um, but that's what that's their policy still. Now, they are implementing a disposal policy to have um, registered disposers, which will be pharmacies and law enforcement. But um, it is a patient's property, and if they want to take it to a disposal facility, they can do that. But um, hospices are required to document that they've educated patients about disposal. So there's still a lot of conflict around this.
So that so there are disposal. different laws that are in conflict. There are. Is that, there okay. are different laws in conflict. Not yeah. not an unusual situation. Right. Or s any pharmacists, Sarah, anyone in the audience wanted to comment on uh, safe disposal Someone or in things the like back had their hand up. About what you do about disposal. So it says that um, any person who has custody or control of any unused aid in dying drugs, et cetera, after the death of the patient, shall personally deliver the unused drugs for disposal by delivering it to the nearest qualified facility that properly disposes of controlled substances, or if none is available, shall dispose of it by lawful means in accordance with guidelines that will be promulgated by the State Board of Pharmacy or the federal DEA approved take back program. So, but, so there is something in law that there is a responsibility for those who are still in possession of the drug. Yeah. So this would fall under the same, I mean, you know, you're citing what's under the DA in the package insert, that's what's in the law, but you've all noticed this is somewhat circular. It doesn't really tell you anything. Um, this would fall under the periodic drug take backs, which we are aware of, which we encourage our patients to take their other unused medications for. Do you want this sitting around for a long period of time? Yeah. That's a whole separate issue. Um, so things to think about could be encouraging, um, you know, companies like manufacturers to issue prepaid envelopes to have them sent back. That makes it very easy for patients just to put in the envelope and ship it off. Carl Magruder, uh, Resolution Care, Eureka, California. We have this community health worker on our team, and uh, she sometimes brings us the most practical observation. And one of her points was, if, if only one in 25 people who even, or whatever the ratio is of people who get it, who don't use it, and then you have a bereaved spouse who literally at that point cannot figure out how they're going to start living anyway, it's very normal to think about your own mortality when you lose someone close. And here's this prescription that's been designed by a pharmacist to take me out of this world. It doesn't seem responsible to leave those drugs in the home. And I realize it's not responsible to leave 40 oxycodone either, but I just have to bring Kat's concern to this Thank August body. So I was just going to take the same opportunity to, to make this point and to just uh, tell people that our social workers address this actively when they are, when we know the medications will be dispensed to say that this is no different than a gun, um, that you need to secure it in a drug box. Um, just as you would any other, you know, uh, controlled substance, and you should treat it as though it were a loaded gun um, in the home be for exactly this reason, is that we understand that there could be um, children uh, who are aware that the person has this medication. Uh, there could be bereaved caregivers who are aware, and, and our social workers do the best that they can to continue to phone the family uh, to specifically discuss the disposal and has it been done and how did you dispose of it and in what way and you know again we didn't do, there's many things that didn't get discussed today but I'm, I'm glad that this did come up because I, I do hope that um, people will give that some thought um, uh, it is very concerning we we don't know that we've had any difficulties with that um, um, but that but this isn't something that we're well equipped or well funded to follow up on as well either as you can imagine um, you know these social workers are incredibly busy doing their day job, uh, you know, to try to keep up with, has the person died? Did they dispose of the medicine yeah. properly? Is the bereaved caregiver okay? Um. Thanks, I think um, I appreciate that comment, partly because it's, it's interesting, the range of issues. I'm, I'm totally amazed at the range of issues that, has, that, will, that policymakers in institutions are gonna have to uh, face. And one theme that I heard that I'd really love some comments on before we conclude is this, the idea that everyone who has engaged in this has said that the policies need to be flexible, they need to be iterative, you need to try them out, you need to then get feedback and comment. Well, in my experience, um, that's not the way, um, that, that's not how, for example, the compliance culture operates um, in terms of uh, issues of uh, people being concerned about legal liability and risk and wanting things to be clearly black and white, even though that is hard in the world. And I'm wondering if anyone else had that same observation or wondered how we're going to deal, deal with that. I'm, th I'm thinking about it, for example, in terms of research ethics. I mean, it, that, that you can't sort of just constantly be changing the rules in midstream, because then. From my perspective as a uh, you know, on the ground primary care physician, oh, well, um, yes, 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 this is of a concern. And I'm also just wondering how this is gonna dovetail with the changes in, in our state with the CURES um, registration and 
how that will play out. Um, this prescription could be done electronically. Is there some way to, to um, address some of these concerns and track the cures? And I wonder if any of the pharmacists have any comments on that um, as well. I mean, in our, in our policy for controlled substances, we now have agreements and we can track, we can communicate as of um, the implementation. So there might be some way to track through cures in California that other states don't have the capacity for. So I, again, because they're controlled substances, they will be reported in cures. But you know, every state, I think, except one, has a cure, uh, the equivalent of a cures program. So it's being reported in Oregon and Washington and other states. Um, I don't think anybody really does anything with that data. It just allows you as a provider to access it. Three slides. Okay. This is, well, what's changing is that all anyone that is a prescriber or a, pharm a registered pharmacist has to register with Cures so that you can look up information on your patients, but that's not mandated right now. There are some states you do have to look in that system. Well, it's mandated to register. It's not mandated that you look. So there are some states that before you fill prescriptions, fill or prescribe controlled substances, you have to check their, um, their equivalent of cures. Um, that's not a requirement yet in California. So, And there's a lot of concern, of, obviously, that that will interfere with access to um, pain medications and such. But I don't know that anybody's going to look at that data. I mean, it's a huge amount of data. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, some really interesting issues um, uh, raised here, and I think we'll have to continue that dialogue. Um, so just wanted to try the clickers one more time um, and get a sense of what people are thinking in the room after we've had a day to deliberate on some of these issues. Um, so you have your clickers. Um, can you please turn them on again? And we're going to ask this question um, again that we did from uh, in the first session, how prepared is your organization to respond to the act? Um, and A is very prepared, and D is not at all prepared, and B and C is the spectrum in between. We'll give you 15 seconds this time from now. All right. Um, so take a look. Yeah. So we'll take a look. Oh, great. OK. So A, 4% uh, of people, which is two people, um, feel very prepared. So um, that's good. Uh, 13 people, 29% felt so, so prepared. Um, 51%, 23 of you guys still felt unprepared. Um, and 13%, six of you still f um, felt very unprepared. All right. And someone felt really. Okay, can we get to the. Yeah, you got the next one. Okay, great. Um, yes, please. Okay. So the next slide is then what you thought this morning. So that's an that's a improvement. Yes. <laughs> that's good. And then the last slide. All right, great. Um, and then the last question is. Is this the last slide? Okay. Um, how, how prepared do you feel to assist your organization in responding to the act? Um, so, you know, we only have 100 people here today, um, and obviously there's going to be many people um, in your organizations and other institutions um, trying to figure out a policy, and so we hope that you can be our, um, you know, communicators and, and communicate to the others. So um, A, again, is very prepared, and D is not prepared at all. Um, so. This is good, great. Good. Um, so 29% of you, 13, um, thought that you felt very prepared to um, talk, uh, talk to your organizations about the act, which is great. 60%, uh, 27 of you felt so, so prepared, and about 11% or five of you felt um, a little less prepared, but what's awesome is that none of you guys felt very unprepared, so it's a good, good uh, outcome, I think. All right, thank you. So we're at the end. We are at the end. Congratulations to all of you for bearing with us all day. And thank you so very, very much for coming. I want to do a final uh, round of applause, especially for uh, Lindsay Forbes, who really was the person who pulled this all together. And to my fabulous um, co-organizers, uh, Ben, Laura, and Liz. So thank you all very, very much.